Hello and welcome to Bias Exam Prep IS. As part of your comprehensive news analysis today, we'll be discussing six important articles out of the Hindu newspaper. Good morning to all of you. I hope you have liked, share, and subscribed to this channel and along with our Telegram channel so that you can also attempt all the prelims questions which are coming through. And in this, I will give you two main questions in the end. Now, good morning. Let's look at the topics we are going to cover generally. First is the importance of water something which we understand generally but because the authors of this article are from the FAO and the international what we call as world food program in that regard therefore it becomes important a lot of data is given which I will share with you thereafter we'll talk about Israel Hamas but from a new perspective which is laws of war or what are called the rule of war in the way that there are two basic rules in which war can happen and let's see if this war uh, the Israel and Hamas issue goes into that basic understanding itself then we'll talk about gender gap we'll talk about the Nobel Prize winning uh, contribution what what she has talked about it thereafter three very straightforward simple topics how many unmanned armed vehicles or UAVs we need thereafter a very interesting development with the Indian Railways because they are now trying to tackle new challenges which are coming in the Jammu and Kashmir sector. Last but not the least, something to stop or arrest the decline of scientific community in India which is to raise the age of scientists when they retire to 65. We'll talk about that. So, let's discuss the first topic and as always, first the basic points, then the nitty gritty, then thereafter the conclusion along with the revision. Now this topic has a lot of data, has a lot of intricate points. But what I'll do is I'll first give you the basic condensed form of facts and data which you need to know for the examination. And thereafter we'll look at what are the different types of interventions which have been there. So we all understand the importance of water. Water pollution tells us that today if there's one resource on which wars can happen, there are multiple uh, states which are fighting over water. There are multiple international players fighting over water. Water generally is a very important resource. You cannot live without water for more than 48 hours while you can live without food for more than two to three days. So therefore, the point is water, fresh water is a very important resource when it comes to any form of life on the earth. And the most important unique element about the earth is also the presence of water which we consume to live. Now, if we look at water as a resource for agriculture, now the article gives you a multiple set of facts related to what is the dependence, what is the potentiality and what is the problem. So first, the data which this article gives you is that close to 60% of all net sown area in India is rain fed which means that they are based on the erratic monsoons without the rains 60% of all net sown area which is be it the kharif be it the ravi be it the uh, millet wheat or rice crop all net sown area 60% is rain fed now out of this 60% 40% of all food production in India comes out of this 60 percent so this means that close to 40 45 percent let's take 40 percent of all food grown in india is based on 60 percent of the land which is being used but all of this is based on the monsoons and therefore they are quite vulnerable to any form of extreme weather event any form of erraticness in the monsoon itself, be it El Nino or La Nina, or they are extremely prone to any form of global warming based climate change patterns. So therefore, when we talk about agriculture in India, it is already in the vulnerable scale because of the fact that it is based on the monsoons. Thereafter, the article argues that 72% of all fresh water withdrawal be it from the ground sources be it the above ground sources 72% of all fresh water withdrawal is for agriculture so this means that irrigation 
is one of the biggest burden which is there on fresh water resources be it above ground or below ground so be it wells step wells or what we call as aquifers or be it lakes whatever it may be agriculture along with irrigation because agriculture is based on irrigation these two remain the biggest burden on fresh water withdrawal or fresh water resources on the earth this is specific to india and this is specific not just to india but for the world so this is a generic point now what these two points tell us is that one thing is very clear without water agriculture can't happen that is a given obviously and one thing is that india there is a issue of monsoons and therefore any climate change based event can impact agriculture in india 40% of food production and over and above that the biggest burden on the fresh water resources is the agriculture based irrigation technology now over the years over the years what we've done is what we've done is we've had poor water management and this is not just specific to india this is for everyone poor water management we've had more than needed extraction of fresh water 80% of all farmers who are small scale farmers they become vulnerable because of these practices itself and over and above that add to it climate change and extreme weather events one thing is very very clear that we are taking water for granted which is that there is a pattern which is emerging under which 80% of all farmers across the world which are small farmers are now facing vulnerability from three major threats which is poor water management over extraction and climate change along with extreme weather events and what this article talks about is now the most important data which can be given to you which is how something like this all these practices can impact india so the government of india has released an estimate that between 2050 and 2080 the following will be the impact of overuse of water overuse of air fresh water and extreme weather events on rice rain fed irrigated wheat and maize there will be a reduction in production at the scale of and here is the interesting part 20% for rain fed in 2050 and by 2080 this will become 47% meaning 50% reduction in 50% reduction in rice production after by 2080 thereafter irrigated 3.5% to 5% on wheat 19.3% by 2050 40% by 2080 and last but not the least maize 18% to 23% by 2080 now this is what you have to remember this is the most important data which this article can provide us which is that the point is we are estimating and this is a government of india estimate that by 2080 there will be a 40, 50 close to 50% reduction in rice based production on which is monsoonal based rain fed rice irrigated rice 5% but that will only become more and more because we will then use ground water wheat 40% reduction and maize 23% reduction maize being a very resilient crop still sees the problems of very gross or very bad water management so the as i said the article has a lot of data but i'm trying to condense it first point it made was India is reliant on the monsoons that is given by the 60% 40% concept 72% of all extraction is for irrigation and 
there after poor water management extreme more what you call as over exploitation of aquifers and climate change and extreme weather events are now creating a pattern in which by 2050 we will see the impacts on food production and by 2080 there will be a major major issue when it comes to now there are two words which are very important food security and nutritional security which is that if this remains like this if this is the pattern which remains then food production along with food security and nutritional security is going to become a problem now this is the problem part side this is the problem side that what are the ways in which taking water for granted that is what the article says the world needs to stop taking for grant water for granted this is the point and because today is world food day and the theme was water is life water is food there was an important aspect which this article wanted to point out and because it has been written by the directors and different personalities related to the fao and the world food program it was important to understand this is the basic data which is important for you when i'll read it out from the ppt you will realize it's scattered around but it's a base basic data which is important for you to understand the impact of non what we call as non sustainable use of water now what is the way forward what is the way forward we now know the problem we know the problem that food security and when it comes to nutritional security there will be an issue now there is standard words which you will find and this article also talks about that first sustainable fresh water irrigation technologies climate resilient crops seeds and practices crop rotation and use of more climate resilient crops and better water management now these things you already know these things you already know because they are part of standard ways in which we can make the earth better when it comes to water management but this is where this article was invaluable wherein we are talking about a lot of data which can be used for gs paper 2 gs paper 3 even it ethics paper in essay you can use any of this data which is available to you this one being the most important in that regard and over and above that you have a way forward which is sustainable irrigation technologies which is that the water is reused it is in a way what we call used in a way that it does not evaporate too much in which we can integrate solar power plants or solar projects with irrigation technology in which it reduces the rate of evaporation you need better seeds better crops maize is emerging millets is emerging as a very important crop which can be climate resilient also can be produced in very harsh climates there after crop rotation don't be on just rice just wheat try to mix and match and better water management would be whatever water resources we have we have to use it better so this is the basic point of the article two basic things first the issues and second the solution and i hope that you understand it and you are following what is happening till this point now let's do one thing let's read it out from the ppt through the article itself let's read it together and then i will revise it with you once it is over again so the importance of water is that water affects every aspect of life we know that 60% of all india's net zone area is rain fed contributing to 40% of total production and there is a urgent need to adapt climate change based or what we call as certain practices which can allow for climate change to not impact the rain fed production and even irrigation sustainable water management is critical and needs to be there for food security and nutritional security and in turn irrigated agriculture accounts for 72% of global fresh water withdrawals and therefore it has a lasting damage on the ecosystem and on the environment generally so this is 
all in one slide this basic point which is that this is the importance of irrigation and water in agriculture so it's trying to establish that thereafter what has been the issue the issue has been decade decades of poor water management misuse and pollution climate crisis adding the vulnerability of small scale producers to climate shocks land degradation 40% of all land on on the earth has already been degraded because of poor water management water erosion and generally soil erosion and soil pollution and water pollution 80% of all farmers which account for the small farmers on the earth are also affected by these problems which are coming through with water and soil itself extreme weather events are becoming more and more severe more and more common and therefore all of this can impact crop productivity and food availability which is food security now the government of india has assessed the impact of this and this is the most important slide or this most important data which is available to us that what will be the impact of climate change in 2050 and 2080 So when we talk about 2050, 20% reduction in rain-fed rice yield, 47% reduction by 2080. Irrigated, 3.5%, 5%. Wheat, 19.3% and 40% by 2080. And maize, 18 and 23%. Again, keep it round figures. It will help you. This is what I have right now told you. Keep it round figures. 20%, 4%, 20%, 18%. 47 you can make it 50 if you want to or 45 47 5 5 40 25% so keep it a round figure so that you remember it one third one fourth whatever you want to say that is also good enough just have to remember this data for the examination so that you can use it in different places to get an edge over other aspirants now what is the way forward and this is where they are now starting to bring in their perspective as fao members as world fold food program members that irrigation has to be the only effective way in agriculture can be made sustainable can be made more resilient and therefore the world food program has been talking about soil and water conservation building irrigation channels dams ponds and dikes which can help for better what we call as water management thereafter the food and agriculture organization fao has been talking about agri food systems climate smart agriculture practices better water efficiency and that is why in uttar pradesh in andhra pradesh there are multiple programs which the fao is running for example it is a farmer water school program in which the small holders have been told the importance of water how to use water in a better way in andhra pradesh farmer management ground water systems are there from 638 inhabitants again too much data to remember just now they are talking about their perspective that how are we doing something so in different states they have different programs in which they are trying to talk about different aspects and therefore it's about sustainable transformation sustainable agriculture now in maharashtra odisha uttarakhand nagaland and mizoram there are again multiple programs which are running for climate resilient seed varieties crops to be introduced they are training farmers to be more climate sensitive and the world food program again is collaborating with odisha government to find a solution for the small holders now there are multiple things which are written now this becomes again important for you which is how do we undercut this concept we undercut this concept by investing in now there are multiple points whatever you can remember you can remember innovative and proven technologies that allow for better productivity adapt to climate change and become more resilient environmentally and socially sustainable and financially viable irrigation water management strategies reduce carbon footprint of agriculture also reduce the impact of biohazards environmental pollution bring sanitation drinking water supplies closer to the rural household effective food and water recycling strategies institutional arrangements capacities and assess and have ownership this is the most heaviest i've ever seen a topic to be or article to be too many points crammed into one small article this could again be important for you for as a solution or a way forward in the examination so there are two things which you have to remember for sure which is how do we come out of it it is this way and over and above that this data which i have written here so this article has four aspects to it let me bring them together first is the importance of water which we all understand already 
but to agriculture it is very very important thereafter it talks about the issues which remain for decades which is poor water management climate change global warming this and that and thereafter potential impact and this is the potential impact where you will learn it because that will help you in the examination for writing better mains answers and the potential way forward is what you can again remember because this will again help you in writing better answers for essay and generally for gs paper 3 so these are the two aspects which are important with 20 50 20 80 data which has been given and the different forms of investment in different areas which can allow for better answers this is a vague solution because the, these organizations will only talk about vague topics itself they will not give you very pinpointed solutions use this paragraph to write any answer and your work is done so i hope that this topic is clear now i want to move to the second one which is equally interesting equally important we've been talking about israel palestine in different capacities we've been talking about israel palestine and generally the war as it is happening quite a lot but this is an article which actually is worthy of discussing which is the rule of law and or the rule of war or laws of war according to the UN Charter. Now I want you to pay attention now because this is going to be very significant for you and very important for you because there are multiple things which we will not find in standard books discussed here. So when we talk about laws of war before we go to Israel and Palestine and Hamas Let's discuss the basic point here. The basic point here is that there are two major laws, two laws. The first law talks about under what condition and when can a state use force against any actor so it is about when and what condition you can use force which is that is the force justified so it is about when can I use force and the other aspect or the other law which goes along with it is, and this is more important, is that how will this, how will this war be conducted or fought? And this is basically how do I go to war? Or, or what are the means of war? So the first one is, if I have been attacked upon, under what condition and when am I justified as a state to act? And the second one says that, okay, your act is justified, but now how will you conduct the war is more important. So the first one is easy, which is that, okay, I have been acted upon, 9-11 has happened, for example. Now, is it a condition in which I can use force? International law, UN will say, yes, you can use force. You have been attacked upon. But the second one is the most important, and that is why it is also called the International Humanitarian law IHL international humanitarian which is that if you are at war what are the acts which are justified so if the act of war is justified what can be the means or what actions by the state are justified? Are justified. 
and this is where international humanitarian law comes through now let's take our case study which is israel and hamas now is israel's action or is israel's declaring of war against hamas justified the answer is yes because again according to the un there can be two types of armed conflicts this is an armed conflict there are two types of armed conflicts one is called international armed conflict and on the other hand there is something called non international armed conflict and here the niac it is here that hamas comes through international armed conflict is between states is between nations and for example how we tackle the taliban how we tackle the jaish e mohammed we also have what we call as a niac which is a non international armed conflict which is mostly with terrorist organizations or insurgent groups so the first condition is getting justified so again repeating myself there are two things which i want to discuss here two very different things here first is the fact that what are the laws of war you should know as a upsc aspirant as a future ifs officer you should know this the laws of war are very straight forward under what condition and when can a state use force this is are you allowed to go to war this is the question here here in israel hamas the answer is yes because there are two types of armed conflicts which can happen international armed conflict non international armed conflict non international armed conflict is with what we call as what we call very simply as terrorist organizations insurgent groups and international armed conflict is with different nations so here the first condition gets justified totally now the second condition in the laws of war is that okay you can go to war but now how will you fight this war is something also you have to take care of because there are multiple things which are need to be or need to be considered in that sense now this is nothing but okay you can fight but you can't use certain things and there that is why it is called international humanitarian law so first condition is getting justified for israel and palestine that yes israel is justified in acting the way it is now let's discuss the second aspect i hope you understood the two laws when can i act second how do i act and hamas and israel is okay you can act because force can be used now what i want to discuss is the second aspect second aspect is international humanitarian law which is how and the most important principle of the international humanitarian law is distinction between combatant or combatant or terrorist and civilian an aspect which i have been talking about throughout this whole project itself or when i'm be talking about israel and palestine i've been always talking about how the palestinians are different and the hamas is different so hamas would be the combatant and the palestinians would be the the civilians and the very important principle within international humanitarian law is that you are justified to use force here force can be used here but force should not be used here should not be used here wherein you are not going to kill people because of a terrorist organization saying that everybody is the same and now comes in our assessment of israel palestine under this understanding now what hamas did was illegal under this law which is killing civilians because it did not distinguish between the army and the civilians it is totally illegal it did not act in the right way and it was totally out of line in that regard now comes israel's response 
Now here it becomes a complicated issue because under international humanitarian law, there's a concept of proportionality. Concept of proportionality. Proportionality means that, for example, Hamas, for example, kills 1,000 people. There cannot be a situation in which you kill the Hamas also and 1 crore Palestinians. This is called disproportionate use of power. So, what Hamas did was already a disproportionate use of power, which is killing civilians which are not armed. Israel, there are two issues here. Firstly, how it has asked 1.1 million Palestinians to move, to migrate is again illegal and disproportionate. And on the other hand, the way it is killing the civilians, that is also illegal. Because close to 1,000 to 2,000 Palestinians have also died. So now when we assess the second aspect of this war, we get only illegal acts. And this is what I talked about on Sunday also and on Saturday also. That Israel has to act like a responsible power. Has to act like a responsible power. Because if it doesn't, then it obviously has a capacity to be disproportionate and also to not use this distinction. Because whilst the Hamas did not make this distinction, the Israelis are also making it very clear, very conveniently to not make this distinction, which is the problem. So why have we done this article? We've done it from a different perspective. We've done it from a totally new perspective, which is the rule of, or what we call as rules of war or the laws of war. And we've tried to understand what is really happening. And this type of analysis is quite unique because this you will not find in standard books. So let me do one thing. Let me read the article to you again from the perspective of the author. And then we'll again assess everything in the understanding of what we should understand. So... What are the laws of war? There are two separate independent international law questions related to war. First, under what conditions and when can a country use force in their international relations? This is called just ad bellum, which is regulated by the UN Charter itself. But the most important aspect in this law is the second one, which is how is a war to be fought? That is, what military actions are permissible, which is called just in bellum. Now, what is the argument is, whatever be the just at bellum, which is the reason to go to war, just in bellum cannot go beyond the international humanitarian law. So, assuming a country is justified under the UN Charter to use force, it still has to satisfy the second one, which is what military actions are permissible and therefore justifying the use of force does not relieve the country of the obligation to use force within the international law itself. Now, the how, the second law, is actually also called international humanitarian law, which provides for the fact that what are the rules which are to be applied in an armed conflict. No matter how the war started, the warring parties must comply with the humanitarian law. Now comes the question, do, does the first principle apply to Israel-Palestine? And the answer is yes, because Israel and Hamas is an armed conflict and the International Criminal Tribunal has already argued that when there is a resort to armed force between states, between governmental and non-governmental action, it is still considered an armed conflict and within that the state is justified to use force. International law classifies two types of armed conflict, international armed conflict, non-international armed conflict and they have, they are all gu guided by the same articles of the Geneva Convention and therefore the non-governmental force where, wherein Hamas is involved 
is the this makes israel and palestine or israel and hamas the second concept which is the non international armed conflict where israel is fighting hamas and therefore israel and hamas need to now or are or very simply are obligated to follow the international humanitarian law hamas will obviously never do it now the primary objective of the ihl is to have a distinction between combatants and civilians warring parties can only attack combatants or military targets not civilian targets indiscriminate attack that fails to distinguish between combatants and civilians is forbidden and illegal that was hamas action was illegal wherein it actually tried to use its historical justification for the palestinian sector whatever be the justification what it did was illegal on the other hand the military action of israel is also problematic because it is disproportionate and it is harming the civilians israel has reportedly dropped 6000 bombs on gaza which is a disproportionate use of force and in the end the fact that israel has stopped food electricity water fuel to gaza strip is again collective punishment of civilians which is again illegal and therefore all actions till this point are fundamentally violating the tenets of the international humanitarian law punishing all gaza strip residents for hamas's action is illegal and a war crime and therefore we need to make sure that israel does not go out of hand here and this is why we are discussing this topic so there are two things before we move to the third interesting article here two things which you need to understand which is that there are first two laws one on when can a force be used and then how much force can be used when and how and this one is called international humanitarian law when we talk about israel palestine issue whilst the when is justified because it's an n i a c which is non international armed conflict the how is not getting justified on either act, either ways neither the hamas is getting justified more problematic is israel's disproportionate use of power disproportionate use of military action and punishing everybody who is in the gaza strip or the west bank for what the hamas did this is the problematic aspect here this is what you need to understand this is again adding nuance to something which has been happening in the world for the past one week you need to understand it in that perspective also and move forward in that sense also so i hope that you understand the basics here which is the two laws which we discussed here first and second and how the first law gets justified but the second law is getting violated and all different arg arguments beat is their response of asking everybody to move the fact that he they have stopped food water and electricity to the sector and even killing the civilians the basic distinction is not getting justified okay so i hope first two articles totally clear first about water potential impacts not taking for granted second word israel and palestine hamas and now we looking it from a different lens which is international law and specifically laws of war so with this we move to the third one which is equally interesting which is gender gap and gender roles in the market and the household now there was a 1992 nobel prize winner who's called gary becker and gary becker actually argued again i'm talking about the basics here listen to me gary becker argued that it was lower education of women vis-a-vis -vis men or the fact that they had to work at home which did not allow women to enter into the workforce or into the market however we know that the latest economics nobel prize has been given to claudia golden and she has talked about very interesting things because the original thesis now again please try to understand the original argument and this is very specific to america very very west centric don't try to look at it through the lens of india because it will not apply as it is india the workforce the way our structural transformation happened how we are based on cyclical male migration how we have still connection between agriculture and industry and industrial revolution in pure sense did not happen these are things which are totally different and would not apply to india there's a very america west centric concept the original thesis was that it is the home or the household 
विच डज नॉट अलाउ वीमेन टू एंटर द मार्केट दिस वॉज द ओरिजिनल आर्ग्यूमेंट दैट ईदर इट इज देयर एजुकेशन ईदर इट इज देयर वॉट वी कॉल एज रिस्पॉन्सिबिलिटीज एट होम दैट एक्चुअली डोंट अलाउ देम टू एंटर द मार्केट हवेवर क्लॉडिया गोल्डिन हैज आर्ग्यूड दैट इट इज नॉट द होम इट्स नॉट द होम इट्स द मार्केट विच डजेंट अलाउ so according to her please pay attention according to her it is the how it is not the household but the market which perpetuates gender gap and gender pay gap now her basic argument or her basic contribution has been what we call as a u shaped curved u shaped curve which is that when it comes to agriculture women's contribution was still significant as family labor but the lowest point came when it was the industrial phase in which they started to become more and more alienated from the productive resources and their rise in employment and agriculture or what we call as generally the workforce is after the service industry started and therefore it is the service industry which dictated their rise so this is the u shaped curve which is taught that industry did not support the industrial revolution did not support the women rather the service industry the tertiary sector supported but there's again very an interesting angle which comes through in this article which is that when the education is equal when the education is equal between men and women when the work is gender neutral that it is neither a man job or a woman's job and when the qualifications and everything is equal that there is a woman candidate who has the same degree as a male candidate or a male candidate and a female candidate have exactly same qualification exactly same marks exactly exactly same socio economic condition exactly same understanding and exactly same type of interviews still men are chosen and given more money and women are somehow still not allowed to enter the workforce this is your gender gap and this is your gender bias now how do we explain this how do you explain this that even though everything remains the same still women don't enter the workforce or are entering at a premium or at a lesser pay so this woman is then is basically given a lesser pay than the men and herein she brings in a very interesting word which is called greedy work greedy work and the argument is very straight forward see because women have both household familial and work responsibilities she can only give a limited amount of hours to the work because she has other responsibilities and therefore she is bound by the household also and she can concentrate on her career till a certain point however the market wants men or labor which can work for long hours which can work for overtime and which can work for a employer who wants you to sit there throughout the night figure it out and go in the morning basically work and life balance is something which a woman has to have has to maintain whilst a man doesn't have to wherein the market wants greedy work which is if a woman can give 10 hours and she needs to go back home at for example 9 pm a man can stay back and put in the extra hours which will be then appreciated by the company by the bonuses promotions and different forms of incentives and therein the greedy work which these these companies want 
is what is perpetuating this gender gap. And therefore, what is needed or what is the need of the hour as of right now is to move beyond the concept of just having long hours and only appreciating and rewarding people who are very, very hustly, who don't look at their life as life, who only look at their life as work, work throughout the day itself, are ready to sit in the, in the office for another 10 to 15 hours, wherein the managers, wherein the people are asking for that type of commitment itself. This is where the gender pay gap comes through because of greedy work and the greed of the employer, wherein wherein there's a theory that if there are two there are two people who are ready to work for extra hours and the work is for three people they would rather take the two people and make them work for longer longer hours this is the problem women are obligated or are somehow bound by certain responsibilities and in which they cannot push in that much amount of work and they have to balance both work and which is public and private and in that sense this is the problem and this is where Claudia Golden really deserved this Nobel Prize because she has now argued for a very interesting thing that if everything remains equal, it is still the market which is the problem because it is perpetuating certain sense of values, ethics and certain pro concepts which are based on greedy work, work, getting more out of the worker and a woman's path in a career is considered to be more conservative rather a man can hustle around, can work for longer hours, for 24 hours and that is what is considered good. And this is where she is arguing that we need to move beyond it. Men have to contribute more into the household also. And in that sense, women can then find that space. And further, the market needs to, in a way, decide what, a, what, what do they want. Efficiency, long work or greedy work or wants a, a, what we call as a worker who works within the hours but in an efficient way. This is where this article is very interesting and talks about her work in a very interesting light. So, Claudia Golden has argued very simply that the missing and underpaid women is not because of the women but because of the market. She has chronicled or she's actually studied the evolution of the American economy from agriculture to manufacturing to services and noted that economic production moved from home to factory. Women were excluded from the market activities itself. It is only when the tertiary sector came through, women found jobs. However, even when they entered the workforce in, in lots of numbers, overtook men in educational attainment, did not congregate in only female jobs, and did not drop out of labor force to have children, women still continue to earn less than men. That is basically, if the men have lesser qualification than women, still they are preferred in the workforce. And this is based on the concept of greedy work, which is, Golden has argued that the disadvantage is due to the inability to take on jobs that involve all consuming responsibilities. Parental responsibilities, make it difficult to women to take on the jobs requiring long hours and irregular work schedules itself. The private equity partner would rather want a person to stay all night and thereafter go through meetings in the day also and get fat bonuses and promotions for that. While women did need not be the ones choosing a slow, uh, slow track, gender ideologies even prompt couples to assist women to take over extra family duties while the men are remain free to concentrate on careers. This is where the man cannot compromise but, but the woman can and that is what is the most important aspect here. So she blames inequality due to greedy work that demands extraordinary effort from workers rewarding them with higher salaries, big bonuses, stock options, fast promotions. Rising income inequalities leads to couples to forego gender equality within the household also and therefore everything goes to the woman. And how do we move forward therefore? Have more male participation in the household. Childcare should not be just the job of the woman. And thereafter you have reshaping of work and social environment so that we have a work-life balance. This means that we need to structure our workforce in such a way that workers time matters and does not really emphasize on very long working hours. And as it is, there's a Stanford economist 
Penekevil, who's argued that longer working hours do not mean more productivity. It makes me, means more mistakes and injuries, which is basically what we say to UPSC aspirants also. It's not about it's not about how long you study, it's about how efficiently you study or how effectively you study. Somebody can work for 10 uh, or somebody can learn for 10 hours, somebody can learn for 5 hours, maybe the 5 hour will remember more because for 10 hours he was slacking off in between. This is a standard thing that is why working professionals or a full-time UPSC aspirant is the same because full-time will have more time to thereafter do other things, working professionals will be more concentrated and therefore that 5 hours will be more effective. So it's about effective work rather than just putting the long hours. So before I move to the Prims White section, this section has been quite interesting, quite intriguing and very very heavy that way. First we discussed water which is importance, predictions for 2050, 2080 what you have to remember and generally the solutions which you need to understand. Thereafter we are tried to understand the, the laws of war, two of them. First, when can I use force? How do I use force? This is the international humanitarian law. Herein, combatant and civilian difference is very, very important. Disproportionate power should not be used. Whilst the first will be justified for Israel. Second, Hamas's action is also not justified, illegal. And Israel's action as of right now is also illegal. Last but not the least is what the gender gap concept tells us. It does not say it is not the household which makes the gender gap, it is the market which makes the gender gap. It is because of the greedy work which the employers want. Women can only put limited hours, but effective hours, but they're not rewarded for that. Rather, men can concentrate more on their careers, can put in those long hours, and therefore they are given more incentive and more promotions. And therefore the answer is a better work environment in which we do not reward long working hours, but effective work in that sense. So with this, let's look at the Prims White section. First is a very interesting study which has come through from the Chief of Defence Staff, which is that how many UAVs, which are unmanned aerial vehicles and armoured helicopters we need. <clears throat> now here, the number is immaterial to you, but you need to understand the emphasis. The study says we need 31 high altitude long endurance UAVs, which is basically you have one of the most most celebrated, one of the most dangerous UAVs in the world, which is the Predator drone and the HAL, which is high altitude. We need high altitude and also 155 MA male, which is medium altitude long endurance. Both are equally interesting. We have our Rustam, we also have our own, own UAVs, but we are looking for better partners for it. And the most commonly used Male as of right now, which is medium uh, altitude, is the Israeli Heron. And we have our own, which we are developing, but it is not at the level of the Heron itself. And over the next 10 to 15 years, the Navy, the Air Force and the Army, all three need a certain set of unarmed or even armed aerial vehicles, along with Apache helicopters, which is very, very important for the surveillance and the maintenance of peace along our borders. So we are looking for further contracts. Let us see where it goes in the long term perspective. Thereafter, a very interesting innovation which the Indian Railways has done. See, because of the Udhampur, Srinagar, Baramula rail link, which is a process in which the Indian Railway wants to link Kashmir to Kanyakumari, the important characteristic about this sector, it is, is very, very cold. And because it is very cold, the biggest issue would be that in the sub-zero temperatures, what will happen to fuel and water? Because the flushes and the basic water system of the Indian Railways would not work at this, at this altitude or at this very, very cold temperature. And herein, the rail coach factory has developed two very important solutions. First, for fuel tanks and toilets, both, which is water and fuel. First is for water, they've made how we have those thermo steel bottles of Milton and all, which is that they've made a certain packing of water tanks in such a way that there are two walls which trap the heat and allow for the water to remain in liquid form for close to 16 to 20 hours, even in sub-zero temperature. This is going to be a game changer because 
freezing of water within the system can also be dangerous because it will crack pipes and can be a danger for the train itself. And the second one is that they've also developed a new technology wherein they have heated pipes through which they're distributing the water and the heated system is leading to insulation. And therein, because water can be dangerous in freezed form, they have now been able to find solutions for fuel tanks and for the toiletry systems and the flush systems. Something very insignificant but very dangerous has now been found a solution for. So we have what you what call heated pipes and insulated water tanks in the Indian railway coaches which will be used in this sector. Now, last but not the least is most probably the center is going to raise the retirement of scientists to 65. As of right now, there's an there's a issue that the, the scientists who come under Indian Council for Agricultural Research have retirement age 60 and the ones under Indian Council for Medical Research have 62. And a bigger issue is that once they retire at 60, 62, which is a very good age when they are at their highest when it comes to the research capacity, they tend to go to other important institutes across the world and there's a brain drain at this level also. And this is what the government of India wants to do, which is to increase this retirement age, first to bring in parity and second to make sure that after retirement age or at this age, they can at least be associated with the government of India, wherein they can also contribute to India's science and technology sphere in a better way. And this way, the Indian government is ensuring two things, parity also and second, not allowing brain drain of very important scientists to, to the West in that regard. So... We've discussed six topics, but quite interesting and quite intriguing in that sense. And all of them deal with different aspects. One was about water, how we do not need to take it for granted. One was about how Israel and, pa and Palestine issue is now going beyond the international humanitarian law. And the other one was about workers and gender gap. And these three talk about the need for UAVs, medium and high altitude ones. The aspect related to how Indian Railways is now doing very innovative research and work when it comes to finding solutions in the long run. And last but not the least, how we are trying to bring in parity for our scientists and make sure our scientists don't leave the country, uh, a country when they are actually at their best when it comes to the research. And therefore, all these six topics deal with GS paper 2, 3 and different aspects of your paper. So with this, let's look at the main questions. What is the international humanitarian law? Are Israel and Hamas within the confines of this law? Very interesting question. GS paper 2, GS paper 3, either way you can ask this question. The world needs to stop, take water for granted. This is again, I picked up the, what we call as title of that and given you as a question. These two are very realistic questions in the examination and I hope you will answer them. Thank you. I hope that you enjoyed the session. Multiple revisions. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye.